All right, thank you for your patience, we're back. So with the housing code, there's an implied warranty of habitability that's read into every lease in the district. Um, so there's no way around it. There, if you are providing rental housing to someone for money, then you have to meet the standards of the housing code. Um, and that applies to the unit and all common areas. The people who do the enforcement of the housing code are the Department of Consumer and Regulatory Affairs. They will conduct free housing code inspections at the tenant's request, or a landlord can request a proactive inspection. Um, if a housing provider does not main, maintain the property up to the standards of the housing code, uh, DCRA can impose fines. Um, also, the tenant can sue the landlord in DC Superior Court. Speak up, though. So that is a thing that has happened. Um, and I'll repeat part of the question so that it's on the record. DCRA has changed their system. There was a time when what they would do is give housing providers that th were not in compliance a notice of violation. The notice of violation would say what section of the housing code was broken uh, and give the landlord like 30 days to fix it before a fine was imposed. Um, and now they have switched systems to do the notice of infraction, which makes it seem as though they are immediately assessing a fine and there's like seven days to challenge it. Um, and the answer is, I don't know um, whether DCRA means what the notice of infraction says. And that's because what they were finding with the old system is that it wasn't as effective in getting compliance. So this new system, I do not know if they are being literal or if they're just saying, I need your attention and people were ignoring me under the old, old way. So to answer that, again, if, if part of what actually happened, that should be directed to DCRA, but there were, the, under the so-called old system, there was just, there was just no, there was just a, a lack of compliance. Not that any of your clients would want to be perpetuated how the compliance was supposed to be. So uh, I, had a, I had a sale, I got an email from DCRA that said, you've got a problem calling and addressing this property. I called and emailed the same day I got the email. They said, we don't know what's going on. And I said, well, what you haven't you know, told us about it. They closed and I'm like, well, The Office of Administrative Hearings is already backed up, and they're going to get really backed up if that's the policy. When I called DCRA, they told me, yeah, this just started in May or something, and that's what it is, that you have to pay this money or fight it. So I think it's going to be like traffic tickets then, so pay or dispute. But I, I don't want to speak for DCRA, but I anticipate that a good faith effort will be uh, looked upon favorably, favorably by the Office of Administrative Hearings. <laughs> no, wait, oh, sorry, and that, that's, that's not DCRA, that's Department of Public Works. Sorry, I didn't mean to distract. So we'll take another question and then we'll move on. Just, just real quick, um, can, you, can the landlord be held accountable for bed bugs? Yes, uh, it depends. That's probably the better answer. <laughs> it depends. Um, bed bugs are treated the same as mice or roaches under the under Title 14 and Title 12G. Um, those are the, the DC municipal regulations where the building code and the property maintenance code are. 
So they say that if you're in a multi-unit building, um, the housing provider is supposed to provide regular pest treatment at the tenant's request. Um, if you have a more than one unit infested, it is assumed that it's the housing provider's responsibility. Um, there are exceptions for single family dwellings, so your condos and uh, standalone houses, where it is possible that it will be the tenant's responsibility, uh, but it could also still be the landlord's responsibility if there are some basic maintenance issues with the house, like place, ways that uh, vermin can come in. So if you've got holes or cracks or entryways for pests, then even though it's a single family unit, uh, the housing provider may still be responsible for the extermination. I also read something here earlier. That if someone has bed bugs here, we have to let the neighbors know. There is proposed legislation. Oh, that's what I read. Frankly, again, I'm not accusing anyone here of being sloppy. If you've got if you've got regular housekeeping and just regular maintenance, this should not be a problem in the first place. Now. That being said, if you have evidence that it was solely the tenant that caused an infestation, you are allowed to pursue that, and frankly, that's one reason why renter's insurance is a great idea in case the tenant gets, gets sued. But please, talk to a housing provider attorney before you consider that course of action. So this is our last question on this, because we really do have to keep moving. So, yes, ma'am? Okay, so what my broker has said is that um, our responsibility um, is to be sure that the tenant receives the property in proper condition and so such that she has our owners to authorize for us to do, you know, appropriate pest control. So saying no pest. So as part of the lease, there is, is language that says that that has happened and that if there's an issue, that now it's the tenant who is responsible. Is that allowable? Is it a single family dwelling? Single, well, single family and up to four units. So no, not for your up to four units. Your single family, maybe. The any two to four units, no. Landlord's still responsible, even after the tenant moves in. Landlord still has to treat the whole building. So two or less, maybe. No, beyond. one. It has one. to be a single family one dwelling. One, maybe, and beyond that, no. Exactly. Landlord's responsible. So relocation expenses. I don't want us to get too hung up on this because it is very, very rare. Um, they only come into play uh, when it's substantial renovation or rehabilitation. Um, if it's a demolition, if it's the discontinuance of the of housing use, or a condo conversion, um, it is very, very, very rare. Next up is quiet enjoyment. Quiet enjoyment is often misunderstood to be just about noise, and it is not. Um, the housing provider is supposed to make reasonable efforts to address disturbances caused by other tenants in the building. Um, the landlord may make any necessary repairs, but may not unreasonably interfere with the tenant's quiet enjoyment of the premises, because quiet enjoyment is basically the right to be left alone in your house. Um, and so then the other bit is notice before entry. So that a landlord must give the tenant 48 hour written notice to enter the unit in non-emergency situations. Um, this is in the code that the landlord can only enter Monday through Friday or sorry, Monday through Saturday, 9 a.m. to 5 a.m., not on federal holidays, and this includes showing the unit. So what I always tell tenants when they're told that their housing provider wants to sell the unit or if the lease is up and they're not renewing and the housing provider needs to show it to prospective tenants is to talk to the housing provider and the realtor and try to work something out that's convenient for all because we understand that's saying you can't have showings on a Sunday, people can't come by after work, that that's, it's a burden, but I feel like that really helps both parties work together for something that works for everyone because the tenant and the housing provider or housing provider's agent can agree to a different situation. 
Um, sometimes what tenants will say is, okay, I can agree to three open houses on a Sunday. In exchange, please don't come to the house Monday through Wednesday. Um, or they can say, you on Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, we can do showings on 24 hours notice. But if we're going to do that, I'm going to need, like, don't come on those other days. Uh, the point of this is about protecting the tenant's right to quiet enjoyment. So wherever possible, work with the tenant. And if there's a tenant in place and you want to show the property, working with them is the best way to go because they're under no obligation to clean it before you show it. So their stuff might be in whatever state they live in and that like they're not they're not wrong for that or sometimes they want to stay they want to be in the unit while you're showing if you all can establish some trust and so and a plan then they might agree to like even wait in the car like just don't be there while you're trying to show the property um, and so those are things that you can negotiate because it's not required because the statute doesn't require that the tenant leaves. The statute doesn't require that the tenant work with you about nights and Sundays. Um, so try to work together. And I saw some hands about this. Uh, were there any questions? As long as it's in the lease, then you should be able to, like in the last 60 days of the lease, you're allowed to show the property. I guess you have to work out the times and all that. So you're going to want to be as specific as possible because I would argue that even if your lease says you're allowed to show the property in the last 60 days of the lease, that you'd still need to give the 48 hours written notice. You still wouldn't be able to come in on Sundays or after 6. So if what you want to agree to is something more stringent than that and you want to do it at the beginning of the lease, you absolutely can. You just have to be specific. So basically, whatever you want to permit or allow or be able to do, you have to put it in writing in the lease agreement and they have to agree up front or yes. it's better to let them be aware that this is what your expectations are. Yes, because the... they agree to is, and sign off on... The statute does allow for you to provide a shorter period in your lease. So they go, if the lease is silent, uh, then we're going to default to this 40 hours written notice. So if you want something different, you have to put it in the lease. All right, discrimination. Um, so the landlord may not discriminate against any tenant or prospective tenant who has a protected trait, um, according to the DC Human Rights Act. Uh, and so the protected traits in D.C. are, there are 19 of them. It is broader than the Fair Housing Act. Uh, so in your leasing, in your showing, all of that, no discrimination. Um, prohibited discriminatory acts include refusing to rent based on a protected trait, renting on unfavorable terms, conditions, or privileges, creating a hostile living environment, refusing to make reasonable accommodations. Um, and so the Office of Human Rights, they're the office who enforces uh, the DC Human Rights Act. Uh, they say their biggest complaint is about disability. Uh, so they have resources on their website. Uh, so Office of Human Rights, ohr.dc.gov, um, about fair housing and about reasonable accommodations and reasonable modifications and what is required by the law. So if you would like to brush up on that, I'd strongly recommend it. Um, what we find in our office is that there are some of the housing, the protected traits under the DC Human Rights Act that people don't think about often. Uh, one is student status. Um, some landlords treat students differently. They're not allowed. Uh, another is source of income. That's huge because that includes people whose rent is being paid by a voucher um, or by one of the other assistance programs. You cannot treat them differently than other tenants. You cannot refuse to rent to them because they are receiving a voucher. Um, and so you just have to be aware of those things. I know there are going to be questions, so. We have a gentleman here. Oh. So one, two, three, four. Okay, you just said about um, if they receive a voucher. Yes. Personally, we take them, but I, I, one conflict would be that I may not discriminate against you because you have a voucher, 
but I don't accept the language in the HAP contract that the voucher insists upon, therefore I can't take your program. So when you call and say, and we say we don't take vouchers because we don't agree, you know, how do you do that? You'll get a lawsuit. That's yeah. what it is, because they just, yeah. the Human Rights Act does not make exceptions for these sorts of things. They're like, it's source of income discri discrimination, um, and well, it's I- not the source of income. I'll take the money from the voucher. I just won't sign their HAP contract, which means they won't give you the voucher. Exactly. They won't let you do the voucher. So, so that- I'm not allowed to do that, you're saying? No. I'm not allowed to the, say, I have to sign I their I think contract. it would be very hard for a landlord to explain to the Office of Human Rights Satisfaction what was the magic language in the HAP contract that they could not well, there is agree one thing to. that's obvious. It's, I forgot what it is, but there's an obvious thing in there that you just don't have to take. What, I forgot what it is. Um, but there's one thing in there that, that, like, of course, as a landlord, I don't have to accept that. Um, I forgot, but anyway. Do you know what I'm so So anyway, oh. my other question was about yes. the whole the protected class. So the, their biggest one is, is disabilities. That's when they get the most complaints about. And I have a problem that I feel like I want to push the issue and go get a thing because we actually have no pets policy, right? And then people, I need a service dog. I've got yep. a traumatic experience. So I'm sympathetic to that. That's fine. Problem is I've also got people who say, I was traumatized too. I was attacked by a dog. I don't want to see a dog in front of me on my premises. So my answer to that is I will, as a landlord, I will make it. Enclosures. Oh, I'm sorry. I will sorry. buy one of those enclosures for your pit bull because everyone wants a pit bull for some reason <laughs> with holes in it to breathe and you will wheel it up to your apartment, let it out in the apartment and then you'll wheel it back because people don't want to see it in the hallway. They're traumatized. They have, a, they have an ADA thing that their psychiatrist says they can't see that they'll be traumatized by seeing the pit bull and allergies. Cats and dogs, I'm allergic to. I, I've had people go to the emergency room almost dying because of allergies. So. We've got both people with ADA problems. And so I yeah. want to tell you yeah. that I went to a DC bar continuing legal education class that was just about service animals. It lasted three hours long. <laughs> and so there are nuances to it. Um, and we even know of a lawyer who specializes in service animals and the laws around it. So we can give you her information um, so you can follow up with her because uh, I think she'll be able to give you a clearer idea of where the lines are. Can I just, can I make one, here's the thing, not giving legal advice, just as a point of legal information, reasonable accommodation means reasonable accommodation. And could there be competing interests? Talk to an attorney about that. Uh, uh, who was first? She's two, then three, then four? Well, uh, so. Two. Okay. All right. Yeah, my question, my question is about um, reasonable accommodation. It's about, I, or maybe quiet enjoyment is part of it. Uh, are there any types of uh, accommodations for people who smoke cannabis who are in an apartment building um, for medical reasons and everyone else in the building? It's similar to the pet issue, or the, not the pet, the therapy uh, animal issue where people in the building cannot handle um, the fumes. Uh, is there any type of legal remedy or any type of accommodation remedy to allow the person to smoke uh, their cannabis all day long and allow um, you know, the people in the building not to get sick uh, from it, especially if they have babies, children, whatever, and it, they just can't handle it? Who, how, so I'm just trying to figure that, out. Uh, that's another reasonable accommodation question that I might take to OHR to see if they can give you some guidance on, also the Office of Human Rights. However, uh, I know that with reasonable accommodations, you're, one of the things that you should try to do is talk to the tenant and see if there's a way you all can make this work. Um, and uh, so when it comes to medical marijuana and uh, the person being able to use it to alleviate their issues. Um, there are still concerns about how it impacts other tenants, and those are valid and reasonable. So I would say you want to go to someone who specializes in reasonable accommodations um, so that they can tell you how to walk that line or and how to engage with the tenant uh, so that you are 
respecting their needs and in compliance with the law, but also uh, respecting the other tenants in the building. If you have a referral for the cannabis, a cannabis attorney, as well as the, the therapy tech attorney, I don't know. The Office of Disability Rights doesn't usually help uh, private individuals because they're mostly to assist government agencies, but they would know who specializes, um, like lawyer-wise, and maybe the cannabis issue. Yes, the Office of Disability Rights is a DC government agency. Um, yes, ma'am? Okay. Um, this is going back to about the voucher and, and I guess discrimination or what have you. So in the case of, of vouchers, there are certain requirements that- Can you hold the, the mic closer? I wanna make sure we catch you. <laughs> okay. There. There are certain requirements that um, a voucher may um, have on an owner that may not necessarily be a requirement of someone who does not, who's in the regular market, per se. Yes. Um, and I can give you a specific example um, where I had a situation where in the inspection, um, the inspector said that the window dropped one sixteenth of an inch when they raised it, okay, and required the owner to put brand new windows in his his, his property, which he could not afford to do. Um, I mean, as life happened, we were able to get around that, but had we not been able to, we would have had to have declined that application. Would that have been illegal? So I... DCHA has the housing quality standards for voucher recipients, and they are different than the DC housing code. Um, and sometimes they are more stringent. The answer there is actually to let DCHA fail you. Um, that's not a great answer. But then it's not the housing provider saying, I can't do it. It's them saying, this unit does not qualify to receive a voucher. Um, and I don't recommend doing that. If you can make the repairs, make the repairs, lease up the unit. Uh, one thing I will say about DCHA is that they always pay on time. No, uh, oh, <laughs> well, that's news. <laughs> but the government's good for it. I think that it is a disservice for us as, as agents, for the tenants, and for the owners to have that fallacy out there because what a tenant will do is with bold chess, you will always get your money. And that is unfortunately a fallacy. So, so you know, and to say you, you will always get your money, you, you gonna get market, that is not true. So you know, Todd, so, uh, what's his full name? Uh, the director of DCHA is here today. Mm -hmm. So, oh, sorry, Woo, I got that really wrong. Oh, cause it used to be Adrian Todman. Yes. Tyrone Garrett, he is here today. Um, and he is ready, willing, and able to answer your questions. Point him out. Point him <laughs> right? Out. Now, here's the, th here's the thing. Just to qualify something that Ramona said earlier, be very careful about purposely letting something fail. Agreed. Because Yeah, because you also, there, you don't want a potential claim that there was constructive eviction. Well, this so, is, bef this is yeah. during lease up, so it's before a person oh, comes in. Oh, okay. Fair enough. In. cost-wise to be, be fair, okay, but there are additional accommodations that are required for this community in order to, to be fair. You know, so, I mean, don't get me wrong, I, you know, because I represent both sides and I, you know, the same way I'm presenting this, I, I'm very diligent for my client. But, you know, in the broader schemes, if you're gonna be fair, be fair all the way around. Don't have you know one side say you are shackled to be fair, and then you're but you're going to do whatever the heck you want to do. And this is invariably what happens with certain populations, as we're talking about you know with the ADA and with the voucher. Whatever, everybody finds the crack in the loophole and they exploit it. 
That's on both sides of the aisles. I mean, I don't like both sidesism as a general rule, but everyone's doing their best. The vast majority of tenants uh, subsidize and market. Everyone's doing their best. The vast majority of them, no problem. I understand that there may be specific instances where either the tenant or DCHA uh, is pushing a little bit further, but I truly hope that that is rare. Um, all right. Um, well, did we? Well, we're on the tenant side, so that's those are the only people that really come to us. Did anyone else have discrimination questions before we move on? Fantastic. So evictions, we're finally here. All right. So the first part we're going to talk about is when the housing provider wants to terminate a tenancy. And then, because you all had some questions, we will talk about what happens when a tenant wants to terminate a tenancy. Um, so the t landlord may terminate a tenancy for only one of 10 spe specific statutory reasons, non-payment of rent, violation of a lease obligation, which the tenant failed to correct after receiving a notice to correct or vacate, sometimes called cure or quit, a uh, tenant performed an illegal act within the rental unit. Landlord seeks to, in good faith to occupy the unit for personal use and occupancy. Um, landlord sells the rental unit to a third party who wants to live in the unit. Um, landlord wants to renovate the rental unit in a manner in which the tenant cannot safely occupy. Landlord wants to demolish the rental unit. Landlord seeks to substantially rehabilitate the rental unit. That's a specific thing that only applies to uh, unit subject to rent control. Landlord seeks to discontinue use for rental housing and occupancy. And landlord seeks to convert the rental unit to a condominium or cooperative. Um, you'll see that everything has a star except for the first one. And that's because for reasons two through 10, you, in addition to serving written notice on the tenant, you also have to file that notice with the Department of Housing and Community Development. And very important, you fumble that step, even if the tenant was, told, was, for example, 90 days personal use and occupancy, the step gets fumbled about serving on the rent administrator, the 90 days has to start all over again. Oh, I've got a question up here. Were you reading from this list? Uh, yes. Because I thought I heard third party, but I don't see Ah, it. so that one is number five. So that's about sale of a rental unit. Generally, when a housing provider sells a unit that's occupied by a tenant, nobody, number five, nobody cares what the buyer wants to do with it unless the buyer wants to live in the unit. And in that case, the landlord can serve on the tenant a 90-day notice to vacate for the personal use and occupancy of the purchase, of a contract purchaser. So that's what five is. Would that still be, if they're selling it to somebody else, it will still be subject to TOPA? Yes, yes. I guess. But I heard recently that it's, you're not subject to TOPA if it's like one. Oh, that's your, coming. If, Don't no, worry. Wait a minute. If it's your one unit person, like if it's just my That is unit. coming. I promise. <laughs> we knew. All right. All right. Um, and then more on evictions. A tenant cannot be evicted just because the initial lease term expires. Um, unpaid late fees or because the rental property was foreclosed upon. Um, in order to evict, the housing provider has to go through the judicial process. So you have to be given the written notice to vacate. Uh, we talked about that on the last side. Uh, if the tenant is being sued for or asked to vacate for violation of a lease obligation, they're supposed to be given a cure period, which is 30 days. Um, and an opportunity to challenge the landlord's claims in court. That's why there's the court process. So the landlord has to file the complaint for possession, then serve the tenant notice that the complaint was filed, what the grounds were, and when the tenant needs to appear in court. The tenant gets to go to court and make their case for why they shouldn't be evicted. Um, I have a couple questions. So what if the landlord doesn't want to renew the lease? They can't. They do not have that option. Wow. And what do they do if they want? I mean, they must have some. Options. No. What they have are the 10 grounds for eviction. That's what they have. That's what DC has determined, that these are the 10 reasons that a landlord can evict the tenant. End of the initial lease term is not one of them. We have, oh, hold on. Mike. Yes. Uh, 
in regards to filing the um, complaint, I, I'm gonna call it complaint. Uh, the 30-day notice. When does it start? Sorry about that. The 30-day notice. When does it start? I mean, does it start like if if his rent is due on the 10th? Would the 30-day notice begin the 11th, or would it begin the first of the month? That's what I'm asking. The if you notice. are giving a tenant a 30-day notice for non-payment of rent, uh, your 30 days starts from the date the notice is given. Um, and arguably, you could give the notice as early as the 6th if the rent is due on the 1st. Um, actually, rent when rent is due on the 1st, it is late on the 2nd. But anyway, let's... Again, we are on this. This is the office of the tenant advocate. So, now um, I will say this: when it comes to when it comes to a notice, that's not what she asked. Okay. Because if the que if the notice is a third day notice uh, for violation of a lease obligation, so a third day notice to correct or vacate or cure or quit, that is different. Uh, for most lease violations, your thirty days runs from when the date the notice is given. But if the if the lease obligation is habitual late payment, then it doesn't. It runs on the from the date of the next day that rent is due. Um, so say the person has been late on rent for years and years and years. It's now July 15th and you're just tired of it. You're gonna give them that notice, the 30 day notice to correct or vacate for habitual lease violation. They need to pay on time on the first for the next six months or you're taking them to court. That 30 days would run from the first of the next month. So August 1st is when their duty to correct needs to kick in. I know it's not cheap, but if you are going to seek a tenant's eviction, please at least consult with a housing provider attorney. A lot of times when you go to court, they throw it out because they say you didn't file the um, notice on time. So that's yes. what I'm saying. It's on time, the, the first, if it's due on the first or the fifth, he has to receive it by the fifth, or is, how do you count the 30 days and make it on time? So what I would advise is to either consult a private attorney or go down to DC Superior Court, the Landlord Tenant Resource Center. Unlike us, they help landlords and tenants. Um, and they can help you with the paperwork, they can help you with the notice that you're supposed to send, because most of them are just form notices that are, were created by the Department of Housing and Community Development. So you can just take their form notice, and then they'll tell you how to do the service, they'll tell you how to count the days, and then they'll tell you how soon you can file and what paperwork you're supposed to file. Because the whole thing, um, even though it's complicated to explain out loud, is very simple once you're actually dealing with the paperwork because it's check boxes and fill in the blank. Um, and so the next part of this is about actually evicting tenants. So you went to landlord tenant court, you were successful, or your client, and now they have possession of the unit. Um, all evictions have to be pursuant to the court order, but the court order goes to the U.S. Marshals, and the U.S. Marshals schedule the eviction. Um, and so there's no self-help. Don't change the locks, don't put the person's stuff out, even if you've won in court. Wait for the Marshals, and when the Marshals come, they'll have you change the locks, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, if the tenant is being evicted for non-payment of rent, the rule in the district is you pay, you stay. So if the tenant pays any time before the marshals get there in full, then they get to stay. And you would have to start a whole new court process if they missed a month's rent. Oh, we've got a question. Mike, let's wait for the mic. No. I apologize. Um, I believe that it's pay what is actually due on the rent in addition to fees, charges, and other whatever. And I think it has to be a cashier's check because a regular check may bounce 
Yes. We so form a payment plus all the listings of things that must be included in that payment. Yes. So in D.C. Superior Court, what they do is when it's an eviction for non-payment of rent, the judge will do a calculation, um, and it's called the Translux amount. It's named after a famous case. And they'll say, this is the amount you have to pay to avoid eviction. Now, that order sometimes comes out a month or two, or in some rare cases, like six months before the eviction actually takes place. The tenant needs to pay that amount, plus any rent that comes due uh, before they are current. Um, and so, and you're right. The landlord can insist on certified funds, so money order, cashier's check, certified check, or cash. Um, and, but if you got any of those, you couldn't refuse it. Um, and for that reason, because the landlord's entitled to secured payment um, at this point in the scenario, situation. Yeah. Can I add something in? Something that cannot and must not be included are late fees. That is correct, because the tenant can't be evicted for late fees. Um, so it's not the, the payment to avoid eviction. Be, and because of that, the payment to avoid eviction also cannot include late fees. All right. So this is more about the US Marshals. Um, they changed their rules, as many of you know. Um, they no longer allow the housing provider to put the tenant stuff on the street. Um, it's just a lock change and a lock change only. Um, at the time of the lock change, um, the housing provider must notify the tenants 21 days prior to the scheduled eviction date. Um, the housing provider will be informed of the state. The marshal service also tells the tenant, but the law specifically says the housing provider must tell the tenant at least 21 days prior to the eviction. And that's going to be that blue sheet of paper that came in the loose pages um, with your binder that goes through the marshal service and the eviction process. So on the date of the lock change, the, you have to wait for the U.S. Marshals to show up, and then the landlord has to leave the tenant's belongings in the unit for seven days. Well, at least seven days. Housing provider and the tenant can work something else out, but the law requires a minimum of seven days. The tenant must be given uh, 16 hours over two days to re remove their personal property. And this the court is trusting and the law is trusting that the landlord and the tenant can work out even though they're not in the best of places <laughs> at the time of an eviction uh, understatement. If the landlord and the tenant cannot work it out, then the tenant goes back to landlord-tenant court and says, Your Honor, I need the court to order the times and the days because my housing provider won't let me in. And sometimes that means that the housing provider ends up keeping the stuff for extra days so whenever possible, be flexible, work with the tenant, let them get their things out. Um, one of the reasons for the change in the marshal's process, because before they didn't give a date certain, they'd say, anytime between this writ and 75 days, we'll show up. Now they're giving specific dates so that a person can self-evict. Like, because they're like, you, we don't have to do this this way. <laughs> now you know when we're coming. If you want to be, if you want to make it easy, you can move all of your stuff out. But for the tenants that do not, you have to follow the rest of this. The, you have to wait seven days. You have to give them an opportunity to remove their things. Um, after that seven-day period, absent a court order, then the tenant's property is deemed abandoned, and you, the housing provider, could remove it. Do we have a question? Okay. All right. Evictions with Gloria Good tenant. So Gloria has quietly rented her housing accommodation for years, pays her rent on time, and follows the rules of her lease. Nevertheless, her housing provider wants her out. Which of the following reasons could Gloria's housing provider legally cite? Gloria's lease will expire in 30 days and explicitly reads that the tenancy terminates at the end of the lease. Is that grounds for eviction? Thank you. We won. Um, the housing provider wants to sell the housing accommodation. Is that grounds for eviction? Yay. Uh, Gloria has a dog, and her lease prohibits pets. The housing provider gave Gloria 30 days to get rid of the dog, and Gloria chose to keep it anyway. Is that grounds for eviction? Yes. Exactly. The housing provider wants to move herself into Gloria's unit. The housing provider has found another tenant who is willing to pay much more rent than what Gloria is able to pay. Thank you. You guys rocked at that. What if the tenant is doing something in the, um, she's, she has a parking space, 
And yes. instead of using it, she's renting it out and receiving money. And it says in a lease that you're not allowed to do that. So that's violation of a lease obligation. So the it's one of the grounds for eviction. Um, there's just the procedure that you have to follow. You have to give the tenant the 30-day yeah. notice to correct or vacate. Uh, if they don't correct within the 30 days, then you have to go to court, all of that. And if you don't even know if they've corrected it because you don't, you can't keep track of whether they're renting out the space or not. Then you wouldn't be able to meet your burden of proof in court because the landlord, when a landlord wants to evict a tenant, the landlord files suit, a complaint for possession. They have to be able to prove uh, what they are alleging. So if the landlord's alleging a housing code, not a housing code violation, a lease violation, they need to prove that the lease violation, that the act happened, that it was a lease violation, that they gave the tenant the proper notice, and that the tenant didn't correct within that period. So if the landlord can't meet those elements, then the landlord can't win in court. And if they can meet those elements, then once they correct that, then they have no more grounds to get rid of the tenant. So if the tenant corrects within the 30 days, then the housing provider is not supposed to file against them in a landlord-tenant court, and the tenancy continues uh, as it was. Um, if the tenant uh, corrects for a little bit and then messes up within six months, then the landlord may be able to still use that original uh, notice to correct or vacate as the basis of an action in landlord-tenant court, but you're going to want to consult with a, land a landlord attorney or with the Landlord Tenant Resource Center to make sure you're not wasting your time. So if that tenant got into a lease agreement with the person that they rented the space to for six months or more, then That's not the housing remedy. provider's problem. Like, no? it, that's not the housing provider's problem. Their only question for the housing provider is, is there a lease violation? Yeah. And, and if there's a lease violation- Within your 30 days. Then the tenant needs to correct or vacate, okay. or you guys go to court. The tenant's contract with this other person isn't your problem. They'll work it out or they won't. Like, that's not the housing provider's piece. And it's not even necessarily uh, proof positive that the lease violation continues just because the, le the original contract continued. Because the tenant could bring that person into court to testify, oh, no, we did have this contract, but then the tenant terminated early, um, and so I don't rent there anymore. So it'll... It would be fact-based and like proof-specific or fact-specific. Um, we've got a couple more questions, and then I want to talk about tenants' terminations of leases. Okay, um, just so we've been arguing about this a little bit lately. <laughs> so you give the 30-day notice to cure or quit. There's two things that happen sometimes. They, like you say, they they cure it in 30 days, but then six months later. So does that go on? How, you know, what would be reasonable? Six, six months, months a year? Six months? Okay. Like that's what the case law says: okay. is you get a six-month oh, really? window. Okay, good. That's good. So my lawyer didn't even tell me that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> then the other one is though. What well, my mother screams and yells, but she's right. For 30 days, they can just la la la. Look at my pit bull. Blah, 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 you know, do yes. whatever they want in your face. Yes. For 30, so they. So they can really just keep offending, offending, offending for 30 days as bad, yes. fighting, drugs, whatever. And yes. Unless you can get them arrested. Because the statute says yeah. 30 yeah. days. They've got 30 days to correct. To stop so being an idiot. <laughs> they've got 29 oh, days to work it out. Yeah. Okay. And if they are good by day 30 and they stay but good, couldn't I, then... Couldn't I, if I say had them on video acting the fool, um, you know, outside, the cameras catch them on video, couldn't I go to the judge and say, look, they stopped on day 30, but look what they did. They did this on purpose, you know? No, because so here's not, the not, not to get too distracted. You mentioned drugs. There are separate provisions of the Rental Housing Act and other laws that deal with criminal activity. So and no. drugs specifically. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, just earlier you had too that it seemed to be that you could evict that you could terminate the lease early if they committed a criminal act in the unit. Yes. So it doesn't matter what it is, smoking drugs, if it's illegal, or so fighting, or what? here's the thing. There are two ways to deal with that. One is for tenants who receive a federal subsidy, because the standards of proof are different. But if you're trying to evict a tenant, um, a tenant who is market rate, or even a Section 8 tenant, but under that particular section of the DC code, you have to have a judicial determination that a crime has occurred. So you'd have to actually wait until the person was convicted. Uh, so it's not enough that they got arrested. It's not enough that you know that whatever they did in the unit was illegal. A judge has to say it was illegal before you could proceed on that grounds. Um, and uh, we had a couple more questions. For 
I just had a question about the, um, the little yes. check. Uh, what does it mean eviction will not occur during rain or freezing temperatures? Marshals aren't going to put change someone's lock if it's raining or oh, the temperature at that stage. drops okay. below freezing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you can serve during the worst or not? Uh, oh, yeah, no, the it's the actual lock eviction. change. Okay. Yeah. I was just going to go back to his, what he was speaking about. What if this person has a pit bull and they're like using it as intimidating intimidation towards tenants? I mean, you so know. the ten reasons are the ten reasons. If you're charging, if you're using that as a lease violation, if that's the grounds that you are choosing, there is a thirty day notice to correct or vacate. If you are arguing any of the other grounds, then it's the rules for that grounds. Like it's all so very specific. And if you take a tenant to landlord tenant court for say non-payment of rent, um, but you didn't mention that there's this lease violation that you also have a problem with in the complaint, the judge won't listen to the lease violation stuff. The judge won't care how bad a tenant is. The judge will say, we're only here on non-payment of rent because of the paper you filed. So you get to pick the grounds. And if once you pick the grounds, that says the that determines the rules of engagement. So we don't have a slide on tenant terminations of leases, but after this, we will add it. Um, so what happens is a tenant can terminate the lease at the end of their initial lease term by putting in a proper notice of intent to vacate. Um, the amount of days, the amount of days required for that will be determined by the lease. Um, if the lease is silent, it's 30 days. Uh, once a tenant is month to month, the tenant can terminate their tenancy with a 30-day written notice, but it has to include a full calendar month because there's no requirement to prorate the rent. So if the tenant puts it in on August 15th, they don't get to leave on September 15th, they leave on October 1st. So they have to pay the full month of September's rent. Um, and I guess I should clarify that. Your notice of intent to vacate is more about when all of your stuff will be removed and how much rent you are paying. So by, if that tenant wanted to move out on September 15th and remove all of their things, that's fine. They just still have to pay all of September's rent. Um, and so that's how the notice of intent to vacate works. Um, so do you have a question of what you just said? Can okay. You yes. So uh, for a notice of intent to vacate, it has to include a full calendar month. So if I put in my no notice on August 1st, I can be out September 1st, meaning I only pay August rent. You put in your notice 30 days before you want to vacate. Yes. You put in your notice 30 days before you want to vacate, and it needs to be a full calendar month. And you can move out. You can physically remove your stuff anytime you want before that deadline. You just are paying for the full month, whether you move out seven days before you told them to or, like, midnight the day before. And then you have the 30 days to move out. Yeah. You that 30 day exactly. Um, and so that's what I meant. If but same tenant who wants to move out September 1st, if they put in their notice August 15th, they don't get to move out September 15th. They actually have to, their vacate date is October 1st. So they're still responsible for all of September's rent. Are they entitled to this month of rent? Um, if they gave a proper notice of intent to vacate, yes. Yeah, so if they paid September, then the security deposit rules apply just the same as they would have previously. So hold on, I've got one question here. So this will answer my specific question. In our lease, we actually just noticed that we have a thing that says they have to give us 30 days notice, but they, they have to give it to us in the last three days of the month before they want to move. So they can't give it on the first, they've got to give it in the last three days of the month before. Is that really allowed? Because we're trying to get a full 30 days notice and some months are 28 and all that kind of so stuff. So if you did that, um, you would have to look at the specific code provision because it actually says if you want to do anything more than 30 days, uh, that you also have to include other specific language, such as like you're going to give your rent increase, no your notice of rent increase, at least 15 days before the date that the notice of intent to vacate is due. So it's it gets complicated. So if I were you, I would have your lawyer look over your lease to make sure that it's in compliance. And if not, just make that minor adjustment. Um, can you hear me? Yes. So with issues like midday, 15 days, and things like that, would you recommend that a person speaks to tenant landlord um, office and say, this is the situation, 
on what grounds of the law and the regulations do I stand on and how do I procedurally move through this process that is in a perfected way? If you go to the Landlord Tenant Resource Center at DC Superior Court, they can walk you through that just the way that you mentioned. If you come to our office, we will not help you because we are the Office of the Tenant Advocate. So we don't help landlords and we definitely don't help landlords evict tenants. And we get it, yeah, I understand, but we often get people say, but I just wanna do it the right way. I'm trying to protect these tenants, so you should help me. And I'm like, you shouldn't take your legal advice from me because I am not on your side. And I will tell you right now that I am on your tenant side the whole way. So it's better for you if you get your advice from someone who has a loyalty to you or at least to your position. Um, and we just don't. So um, I want to talk about tenants who are, want to terminate the lease early. So what we tell tenants is if you want to terminate the lease early, the very best possible way to do that is by agreement with the housing provider. Because the tenant and the housing provider can agree to pretty much anything that's not criminal and it's enforceable. No one's going to tell you you can't do it. Um, the other thing is in your lease, if you have early termination language, that's your default. So common early termination language is one month's rent plus a security deposit or something like that. Um, and you need to give us 60 days notice before you break the lease. So if you want to avoid a lot of drama about what is owed and what you can keep if the tenant tries to break their lease early, include early termination language in the lease. If your lease is silent on early termination, then we're left to what are statutory grounds that a tenant can break a lease without penalty. One, substantial housing code violations that the housing provider doesn't uh, repair in a reasonable amount of time. That's a little squishy. Um, the other is if you were a victim of domestic violence, um, there are certain protections in the code where you might be able to break your lease with two weeks notice uh, and you'd only have to pay for that two weeks. Um, no or, well, we're getting there. Or you can have the locks changed, which means another tenant may, like maybe your co-tenant can no longer access the house. So that's sort of a lease termination because you're ten terminating someone else's tenancy. Um, and then military personnel on uh, active duty. Like if they get orders deploying them someplace else, they get to break a lease without penalty. Um, so those are your big ones. In DC, you'll see a lot of leases that have a special provision for State Department personnel and diplomats that will also give them the same protections as the military personnel, because you're like, if you're ordered to leave the country, you're ordered to leave the country. Um, and so those are the main ones in the law or that we see in contracts uh, most commonly. Other than that, the tenant is responsible for the remaining value of the lease term unless and until the housing provider gets a new tenant. The housing provider has a duty to mitigate, so they are supposed to make reasonable efforts to find a replacement tenant. We don't have clear case law on what reasonable efforts mean because that part of the law is just really new. Like it was always sort of implied, but we codified it recently, like in the last couple years. So there isn't a good body of law that tests the limits of what's reasonable. Um, so what I would advise is there's no need to lose money on someone who's already shown you that they don't really value contracts. So try your hardest to get a replacement and then uh, talk to an attorney to see if you can recover any income that you lost because the person uh, broke their contract. All right, so, oh, I've got one question. Hold on, wait for the mic, please. So a tenant is allowed to give 30-day notice and move out and get their deposit back so unless they've broken, you know, violated any of the rules? No, or that's not what not. I'm saying at all. I'm saying there are ways for the tenant to lawfully terminate a tenancy. One is at the end of their initial lease term. The other is if they're month to month by giving the proper notice of intent to vacate. The other is if they are in one of those narrow categories um, where people can legally break their, terminate their leases early by agreement per the lease terms, uh, military personnel, the victims of domestic violence, the State Department folks. Everyone else, they are, they are liable for the remaining value of the lease term unless and until the housing provider gets a new tenant. 
and the housing provider is supposed to make reasonable efforts to get a new tenant. So in those cases, that everyone else, um, they might lose their security deposit uh, because the housing provider has lost at least that much income, like rental income on the unit. They might not. Maybe the person broke their lease early, the housing provider immediately got a new tenant, then there wasn't really a loss. So maybe. And what if the tenant brings a new uh, potential renter? That's going to be one of those termination by agreement situations, or depending on what the lease says, a subletter assignment one. Um, I know we need to move on, but I, I'm trying to answer folks' questions. Um, so, like I was saying, the security deposit for an early termination, it'll really be fact specific. So if a specific uh, fact pattern comes up, then I'd say run it by the Landlord Tenant Resource Center or your private attorney. Okay, uh, this is about retaliation. So the landlord may not retaliate against a tenant for exercising any tenancy right. Um, we have examples of tenant rights. The most common we get is the tenant requests repairs or reports the landlord to DCRA. Um, or they start trying to organize a tenant association in some of your larger buildings. So prohibited acts of retaliation include unlawfully seeking to recover possession of the unit, increasing the rent, decreasing services, increasing the tenant's obligations, violating the tenant's privacy, harassment, refusing to honor the lease. Um, don't do those things. So, right to organize. The landlord may not interfere with the right of a tenant to organize a tenant association, convene meetings, distribute literature, post information, or provide building access to an outside tenant organizer. Um, and if you're, one way to think about it is you have to let the tenants do anything you would let anyone else do. So if you let dog walkers post on the community bulletin board about their services, you have to let the tenant association post on the community bulletin board about their meetings and whatnot. All right, conversion. The bottom line is this. Uh, in DC, a rental housing building can be converted to condominiums or a cooperative. In order to do that, the tenants have to agree. So the landlord says, I want to convert this building to a condominium. Then they have to hold an election. The district's conversion and sale administrator certifies the election, um, and voila, the building converts. They certify the election. If the tenants vote in favor of the condominium conversion, the place becomes condos. If the tenants do not vote in favor of the conversion, the landlord's stuck with rental housing. Um, and the one exception to once a building converts, tenants have the option to buy or move. Um, except for tenants who are low income and either elderly, over 62, or have a disability. Um, if, those, if a tenant meets those, those conditions and they do not participate in the election, then they get to remain in the building even after it's converted um, as a tenant subject to rent control. All right, so this is the one that we anticipate getting the most questions about. Uh, it's about TOPA. So the Tenant Opportunity Purchase Act is, gets triggered when a landlord sells a multifamily rental accommodation, discontinues rental use, or demolishes the rental unit. Uh, that if that happens, the housing provider must offer the tenants the opportunity to purchase the accommodation. So that doesn't mean that the tenants have the right to purchase it, like the, they absolutely get to buy it. It's just that they have the opportunity. Um, and we'll get into how it's treated with different types of buildings because the law breaks it down between single family, two to four units, and five or more units. Not all transactions trigger TOPA. So transfers you sometimes don't trigger TOPA, like if a father wants to give it to his son. Um, that may not trigger TOPA. That may just be a notice of transfer. Um, foreclosures don't trigger TOPA. So this is where it gets fun. So single family accommodations. The law changed on how we treat single family accommodations um, under TOPA. Previously, Tenants in every type of building got the opportunity to purchase, no matter, and the differences was just, were just on the timing. What the council did is they said, 
if you're a single family accommodation, to find a structures that contain rooms forming single living space and kitchen intended for living, eating, and sleeping, including places that have accessory dwelling units. So that's the basements or the freestanding carriage house, or there's a tiny apartment in the attic. All of that is still considered a single family accommodation, um, that they were gonna change it so that most people will no longer have uh, the formal TOPA rights in a single family accommodation. What happens now is that within three calendar days of the landlord soliciting, like putting the place up for sale or receiving a written offer uh, to purchase a single family accommodation, the owner has to provide the tenant with an intent to sell. Um, and that intent to sell, ugh, that intent to sell is really uh, something that goes out to the tenant that says, do you qualify for TOPA um, for the single family accommodation? And the way a tenant in a single family accommodation can qualify for TOPA is that, that <clears throat> The tenant has to be either over 62 or have a disability. The tenant also has to have moved in to the unit before April 2018 and have a written lease that was signed before March of 2018. Something like that. Um, so everyone who moved in after April of 2018, they do not have TOPA rights in a single family accommodation. It doesn't matter if they're elderly or disabled. Like, you have to have met those residency requirements, and there has to be a written lease. I've had to tell people who have lived in a property for 20 years on an oral lease that they didn't get TOPA rights. It doesn't mean they can't buy the property, they just don't get any priority as tenants. Um, and so, so the landlord just has to give notice to anyone under 62, just so, give notice. So when Your intent. the notice of intent to sell is because we are not assuming the housing provider knows how old people are or if they have a disability. So we're saying tell everyone that you're, you intend to sell this single family accommodation and then that form that they are, the landlord provides the tenant, it comes from DHCD conversion and sales division and it has a paper where the tenant gets to say, I meet all of the qualifications and the tenant has 20 days to send that form back uh, so that the housing provider knows, oh, this tenant actually does qualify for TOPA under the new rule. I need to give them an offer of sale. Um, and that's what's on this page. Um, and so this details their timeline. Uh, so the, offer send, the owner sends the offer of sale to eligible tenants and a copy to OTA. The tenants have 20 days from receipt of the offer of sale to deliver a written, written statement of interest to the owner and trigger the negotiation period. Um, we're on page like 35. Um, and the negotiation period allows everyone 25 days to hammer out the details of their deal and sign a contract. Uh, after that, there's a settlement period where the tenant has 45 days to come up with the financing. Um, that can be extended to 75 days uh, if they have like a letter from their lender saying, we can get it done, we just need an extra 30 days. Um, the only consideration for assignment of TOPA rights, so this is a huge change. If you are in a single, if the tenant lives in a single family accommodation that is being sold and they qualify for TOPA, and they want to assign their rights instead of trying to buy the property. It used to be that they could assign for money and they no longer can by statute. Now the tenant can assign only for the right to remain in the property for another year at the same rental rate. Um, so that's a very large change. <laughs> Hold on, Mike, please. So it sounds like that's only the tenant assigning it to the landlord. He's the only, landlord's the only one who can give you 12 more months. Who would they assign it to otherwise? They're assigning, so the tenant can assign it to anyone. So they can assign it to the potential purchaser uh, if there is one, and that purchaser could promise, like after I buy this place, you get to stay here uh, for 12 months at the same rent. Or the tenant finds a third party who can buy the house, um, and that person gets to, operate as though they were the tenant. So they get to say, landlord, I, this is the, let's negotiate a price. 
landlord says your price is too low, he gets a third party contract, this person I've assigned, the tenant has assigned the rights to can say, I can match that contract, and now they get to buy the house, and they can give the tenant that 12 months at the same rental rate. Uh, okay. So is this, when was that put into law? Do you know? 2018? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is it's kind of It's either 2017 a, or 2018. It is This new. was kind <laughs> of a curtailment on that thing that yes. tenants used to hold up the landlord from selling and all. It's a little bit of a curtailment. That is isn't what it? the council That was the council's reasoning. Um, no comment. <laughs> well, hold on one sorry. person at a time. Yeah, for the captioning. She was first. Oh, sorry. Hi. So, oh, hi. So the um assignee mm -hmm. gets the tenant's right for 12 months. Only. No. No, just... What so, a TOPA assignment is mm -hmm. where the tenant sells, gives, negotiates, whatever, their TOPA rights to just the rights. someone else. Okay, just the TOPA um, and the terms of that assignment are determined by the tenant and the person that they're dealing with and their contract. So, it could be time-limited, it could be open-ended, it can be whatever the tenant and the person they assign their rights to agree to. Okay, but they're getting to rent, to pay the same amount of rent to the for landlord months. for 12 months. Yeah. So they're stepping into the shoes of the tenant? So no, not totally. It's, so here's the thing. What is being exchanged is the tenant is selling their topa right. The price of their topa right is this guarantee that they can continue in the property for 12 months at the same rent. So that's what's being exchanged. The person who's intending to buy can say, I promise that I'll let you stay here for 12 months, I won't try to evict you, and that I won't raise your rent. And the tenant who's selling the topa right is admitting, I'm not gonna buy this house. I can't afford to, I don't want to, whatever the reason, but someone else might want to, and I can make a deal with them so that I can secure my living situation for at least another year. So that's what's happening. That's what's being exchanged. Um, did I have any other questions about this? Because we'll hit TOPA multi-units next. And it might be a little clearer when you talk about the others because they don't have all of these details. Um, so a two to four unit housing accommodation. A group of tenants have 15 days. Okay, this starts after it should. So in a two to four unit housing accommodation, the landlord does not have to give the tenants a notice of intent to sell. Instead, the landlord has to give tenants an offer of sale, and they can do that when the building goes on the market, or they can wait until they have a third-party contractor, um, or a third-party contract, a buyer for the building. That offer of sale will tell the tenants like the terms the landlord's willing to sell the building. Um, in a two to four unit housing accommodation, a group of tenants have 15 days to submit a statement of interest together, or, um, if the tenants don't submit that statement of interest in the 15 days, any individual tenant gets an additional seven days to submit their own. So that's a 22-day period. Um, if a statement of interest is submitted, then that triggers a mandatory negotiation period. So that's 90 days um, where the tenant and the landlord negotiate and try to get to a contract. Uh, during this period, the landlord cannot sell to, cannot close the sale with anyone else. Um, and then if they get a signed contract, the tenant gets 90 days to get their financing in order and close the deal. Tenants. Um, sorry, I'm just kind of at the tail end of all this stuff, um, actual tenant. In a particular situation I can think of hypothetically, an owner, let's say Acme Company own a unit, I mean a, a property with at least 15 units. Oh, then they're different. Well. So if they own a property two to four units, then it'll, we'll apply these rules. If, you, if it's five or more units, then I'll do the five or more unit and then we can answer that question. If, if this is going too far, then just tell me, but DOPA? Oh, we're getting there. Okay. All right. <laughs> we won't leave you hanging. All right, so five or more units. So five or more units of a housing accommodation, the tenant opportunity to purchase right doesn't belong to the individual tenants. It belongs to the tenant association. Um, so 
the housing provider, again, needs, doesn't have to give a notice of intent to sell. Instead, he gets to give an offer of sale, and he has to give that offer of sale, and they can choose to do it uh, when they put the building on the market, or they can wait until they have a third-party contract. Um, and once they do that, the tenants have to form a tenant association in order to put, submit a statement of interest. And they are putting a statement of interest for the entire building. So individual tenants can't say, I want to buy my unit. Uh, it's that the tenant association says, let's buy the whole building. Um, and the negotiation period for that is 120 days. The settlement period is 120 days. Um, usually in your five or more unit buildings, the tenants don't actually buy the building. They assign their rights to a developer, and the tenant association and the developer agree to what's going to happen after this building changes hands. So now, so this potentially um, hypothetical organization, Acme Incorporated, the tenants are writing a check to Acme Incorporated. All of a sudden, January 1, 2020, the, they get a notice, the tenants get a notice that says, write your checks now to Acme LLP. This goes on for two or three years. The tenants find out, not only has the building been sold, but it's gone through an entirely different process that you're laying out here. That can what? happen. And it can be, it happen legally. <laughs> and here's why. Not all transfers are sales. So there are certain ways that a company can like uh, sell the company with, and the building is an asset of the company, but it doesn't count as a sale for TOPA purposes. Or there are ways that a company can change their name, and so now they're officially a different company, but it wasn't a sale. So that's when we have to look at the details and just deep dive into the TOPA statute because it has a whole list of things that are not a sale. That being said, even if TOPA isn't triggered, there is often something called a notice of transfer, which is a disclosure form that needs to be filed with the rent administrator as well as give a copy to the tenant. Again, best business practice, be transparent about it. You want to avoid unnecessary litigation. Anyway. Yes. And so this brings us to DOPA, the District Opportunity to Purchase Act. Um, so the district government has the opportunity to purchase housing accommodations consisting of five or more rental units if 25% or more of the rental units are affordable. Um, for purposes of DOPA, a housing provider looking to sell a housing accommodation um, with five or more units would want to submit, they just have a form on their website uh, to let the district know what's going on and they, the district will either exercise it or not. Um, to the best of my knowledge, it is, if the tenants want to buy the building, the district will not prevent them. Um, so tenants get priority, then the district, um, but the district has rarely exercised DOPA. So how do you know the 25%, you know, affordable, five or more rental units of 25% or more rental units are affordable? What is, what is that, based on HUD's affordability thing? Or? I'm not entirely sure. Um, there is a DOPA form, uh, and I think you fill in the blanks, and then the district figures it out. Uh, I don't think they're requiring you to make determinations up front unless you have, unless you are aware that the building is, say, a luxury apartment building. None of these units are affordable. They're all three grand and up. Then it is unlikely. There's probably someone downstairs during lunch who might be huh. from DHCD who might be better positioned to answer that question. Fair. So next up is vacating the unit and moving out. Um, this We talked about this uh, before about the uh, notice of intent to vacate. On the tenant side, it needs to be a written notice of intent to vacate. Um, and part of that is because once the tenant puts in their written notice of intent to vacate, the housing provider, and they overstay, the housing provider can evict them uh, as a squatter because they'll say this person no longer has any legal basis for their tenancy. They terminate, the tenant terminated it. 
Um, and then, like Harrison said, the housing provider can ask for double rent um, for the period that the tenant overstayed. Uh, but the court will not do that if this was all verbal. Uh, and so then next up is landlord and tenant should arrange for a walkthrough of the unit. Um, if you do a unit walkthrough with a tenant or your client does, just take pictures. Don't make promises um, because there may be some issues that do not you don't see during a walkthrough, but when you're ready to flip the apartment for the next tenant, they come up, and now you're trying to deduct that from the security deposit, and the tenant's like, no, when Sasha and I walked through the apartment, she said it was perfect, and that I was going to get my full security deposit back, and now they want to deduct for plumbing. And you're like, well, did you guys check the plumbing? No. So it's better to just take your pictures, walk them through, uh, and document everything. Uh, and then... Oh, ask the tenant for a forwarding address if they want the security deposit back because otherwise you just, there's not a good way to give it. However, I've seen more and more tenants do like paying by Venmo or PayPal or one of those services where it's bank to bank transfers. Um, in that case, you can trans, if you can transfer the money back the way that you get your rent, then that's usually fine. Um, moving out. Just um, so if the tenant moves out in the middle of the night, doesn't give you a forwarding address, whatever, should you still, let's say you take all the money for the security, for damage, should you still mail it to their last known address, which would be your own unit with a certified thing or what? Okay. I'd say yes. If you have any other address for the tenant, um, it wouldn't hurt to send the notice there. Um, it also doesn't hurt if you have email. Like a lot of times now, uh, landlords and tenants, they email uh, about complaints and like to get repairs um, or they text. So reach out to the tenant in all the ways that you have. You can send the written letter to the last known address you have, but if you can send it to them electronically, do that. Because it's, it's better to say, I sent it everywhere I could um, so that if the tenant tries to sue you, which they probably won't, um, you can show the court that you made a good faith effort to let them know that you withheld the security deposit and why. Um, so the moving out, it's not really for you all, but yes, the landlord may retain any portion of the security deposit that is necessary to fray cost of damage to the unit that is beyond normal wear and tear. Um, also, sometimes we see there are certain utility bills that come after a tenancy has ended. So it's like there's a $30 bill from your last month in the unit. That's going to be deducted from the security deposit, and that's also fine. Yes? Is there any deduction for the rent of the unit? Unit does the rent. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to, if there's anything that could come out of the security deposit, there's usually going to be a cost of the security deposit. So the way it works is the landlord has 45 days to return the security deposit in full or tell the tenant they're withholding some or all. And by tell, I mean in writing. If after that, if you say I'm withholding some or all, then the tenant gets an, the landlord gets an additional 30 days to provide an itemized written notice um, of like the deductions and to return the balance. So maximum you'd have 75 days if you're withholding and you let the tenant know. But if you can give it back sooner or give them the itemized list sooner, that's fine too. But you don't have to let them know before the 45 You have to let them know. So the question was, how soon do you have to let the tenant know that you're intending to withhold some or all? And the answer is you have 45 days to say I'm withholding some or all, and you get an additional 30 days to say why. So I, what we do is stick to 45 days. We don't even get into the 30 because we didn't know. I didn't know I could do it. But we also have our, you know, we've got 96 units, so we have in-house in staff who does it. So I don't really have a third-party receipt from someone. I just make up prices. Mine are generally better than people would give out in the market anyway, but I give them the itemized thing, and if there's a refund, I give them that within 45 days, but generally there's no refund. People trash their places, and they wind up leaving owing us six months rent and all that, so I send it registered letter with the detailed thing of what we charged you, and then you still owe me $3,000, but that's okay. You know, how do I, so, the only way I can protect myself is with pictures. Yes, yeah. because if you all end up in court, so I guess that's the important bit, and then we are out of time, thank you all, um, is this. The housing provider gets to decide well, how much they're withholding from the security deposit and give that itemized list. If the tenant disagrees, then the tenant has to sue. Um, so the tenant sues you in small claims or the tenant files a tenant petition. The judge in those cases 
wants to see things with their own eyes. So they want to see pictures because they don't really trust either of you about how big the hole was. Um, they like receipts. And if there is a challenge to like, how did the person come up with that number? Sometimes they'll have the repair person come as a witness and explain how they priced it. Or if the tenant's like, they charged a thousand dollars for a light bulb, the tenant gets to bring evidence that the light bulb only cost $10. Um, so that's what happens. And then the judge just decides what's fair. So that is everything. Thank you so much for your time. Um, people who had special dietary restrictions, the red card folks, your lunch will be at the registration table to make sure that it's uh, appropriate for you. Um, for everyone else, lunch is in the barn. <laughs>